colloquium. And uh, we are having a school on um, biogenesis. And, uh, and uh, so we have a colloquium that's related to that. Um, you're, um, yeah, so let me first introduce the speaker. So it's been a pleasure to have uh, uh, Thomas Constantin, who is actually, yeah, he's lecturing on some special type of uh, biogenesis in the school, which is Electro Week Biogenesis. So if you're interested in, know, in knowing why we have more matter than antimatter, I recommend you to come to the lectures of, uh, of Constantin, of Thomas. And uh, one of the uh, um, characteristics of uh, Electro Week uh, Biogenesis is that you need a phase transition. So he's going to talk about phase transitions, and one of the things of phase transitions that can generate uh, gravitational waves. So uh, 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 Thomas, uh, he did his uh, PhD at the University of Heidelberg, and then a postdoc in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. And after the postdoc, he was a Marie Curie fellow at uh, IFAE in Barcelona, Spain, and then a fellow uh, at CERN before taking a position in 2011 at, uh, at the theory group at DASI, where he's a scientist, and uh, he has been there since then. So thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for accepting the invitation to give a lecture this morning and also colloquy yeah, yeah. this afternoon. Yeah, no problem. Uh, my pleasure. Yeah, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for the kind invitation. So I enjoy the school a lot. Um, and also, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to, to give this colloquium. So, uh, yeah, not thanks for reminding me how old I am and uh, that I'm at DAISY already more than 10 years. Uh, but actually, the, the topic I'm going to talk about, the gravitational waves from cosmological phase transitions, this is also a story which uh, goes back uh, quite a bit. So, yeah, basically, we started being interested in this topic uh, roughly 15 years ago with uh, people like Geraldine Savant and Stefan Huber and so on. And at the time, it was a really small community. So we have like 10 or 15 people in the world that, that thought about these things and thought it's uh, marginally interesting. <laughs> and now in the last couple of years, this uh, field completely blew apart. So there are hundreds of people that entered, and uh, there's a lot of activity, and it's a uh, quite hot, to hot topic. So I think, in, in principle, there are three reasons why in the last years it became uh, so interesting. The first one is, of course, the discovery of the Higgs. So uh, just finding the Higgs and measuring the Higgs mass was a good motivation just to go back and, and see what this implies for electric phase transitions and then also for the gravitational waves that are eventually uh, produced there. Then the second reason was, of course, that uh, LIGO for the first time observed uh, directly uh, gravitational waves in uh, 2013, which uh, gave a boost to the field overall. Right? And then last but not least, there was an interesting observation uh, in the last couple of years by uh, pulsar timing arrays that can also be potentially linked to uh, gravitational waves on phase transitions. And yeah, somehow uh, all these uh, things together led to the fact that this is a quite uh, hot topic nowadays. Okay, so today I give uh, basically a talk in roughly the parts. The first one will be an introduction, so I will just explain what is a cosmological phase transition, how does it work, why is it interesting, why might it, might it produce gravitational waves. Then I will uh, tell you about the um, recent results, so what is the state of the art of predicting a gravitational wave signal or power spectrum from such a phase transition. And then in the last part, I will talk about these uh, PTA results, in particular the results by Nanograph, which is an American uh, PTA experiment. So yeah, if you have questions, just interrupt me at any time. That's perfectly fine. And uh, without further ado, I will just start with the introduction. So I guess you, most of you have seen this picture before. That's uh, Big Bang cosmology. So uh, after inflation, uh, the universe is reheated and starts in a really, really hot and dense state. And then the energy and pressure in the universe will drive the universe apart, so the universe will expand. And due to the expansion, the universe will cool down. So time is increasing towards the right, but uh, the temperature is dropping because the expansion will, will reduce the temperature. And during this course of the universe, all kind of interesting stuff happens because just that the temperature is changing, right? So just to give you one example, if you think about the, the binding energy of a hydrogen atom, this is uh, electron volts, right? So this tells you that, that as long as the temperature is above electron volts, basically uh, the, the electrons are not bound to the protons, so everything moves freely, and you have a, a charged plasma. But once the temperature is dropping below this, this uh, critical uh, temperature, 
then the protons start to, to capture electrons, and the plasma becomes neutral, right? And this is interesting to us, because at the time, uh, the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, is produced because the photons don't scatter anymore because the plasma becomes transparent. And so they travel freely, and we can uh, still observe them today. Okay? So this is kind of the propaganda picture of what happens in cosmology. But what you actually do as a cosmologist is uh, kind of the opposite, right? I mean, what you do is you observe the universe today. You know all kind of physics, atomic physics, nuclear physics, and then you start calculating backwards, and you try to check if this makes sense, right? And just as an example, I give you the example again before. So you just start with a, you just count uh, uh, galaxies, and you observe the C and B, and then you calculate backwards, and then you basically try to figure out if what you see in the C and B is consistent with what you know from atomic physics, right? So you know the hydrogen atom quite well from the lab, and then you can make kind of a correlation between what you know from the lab to what you see in cosmology, right? And because you see something which makes a lot of sense to you, you say, okay, the whole story makes sense. So probably there was a Big Bang. Probably the universe was in this hot, dense state early, right? But there are also other links. Another interesting link is uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So at even higher temperatures, uh, nuclei are formed, right? And you can also go to the lab and try to understand how nuclei interact with each other. And at the same time, you can uh, then make a prediction. What is the abundance of these nuclei if the physics in cosmology is the same physics that you see in a lab, right? And then you can compare these abundances of the light elements, like hydrogen, helium, and so on, with the abundances that you measure in the cosmos. And if this fits, you're quite convinced that the story makes sense, and that the universe was at some point at a temperature which is MeV scales now, because MeV scale is basically the binding energy of these nuclei. Right? OK, so at this point, everything makes sense. <laughs> okay? So now, of course, it would be nice to extend the story to even higher temperatures. Right? And currently, the temperatures or energies that we're testing at LHC, for example, are in the electric scale, right? These are hundreds of GeV, okay? So now we're testing in the lab how physics works at hundreds of GeV. So it would be nice to have some observable, right, which tells you that what you are uh, testing in the lab really makes sense and correlates with what you see in, in the universe. But in order to, to make this connection, you need some relic, some abundance, right? Here was the abundance of light elements, here was the abundance, the cosmic microwave background. So you need something non-trivial happening, which survives until today, in order to cross-check what you see at LHC makes sense in cosmology. And one of these uh, possibilities is exactly these gravitational waves that might come from the electric phase transition. So if the electric phase transition has certain properties, this can produce gravitational waves. And if you see these gravitational waves, you can correlate this with what you know from LHC and try to figure out if this makes sense. Okay, so overall, if you have such a first-order phase transition, there's not just gravitational waves, uh, as uh, Rogerio mentioned before, there's also baryogenesis. So there's, a, in principle, a second link that you can use to, to connect what you test in the lab with what you expect or know from, from cosmology. All right, so uh, before I move on, I have to explain uh, what a cosmological phase transition is and how it could possibly come about in the standard model, especially at the electric scale. Okay? So if you know how the, the um, standard model works, there's one sector, the Higgs sector, which is designed to break the electric symmetry. Right? And in order to achieve this, you assign a quite funny potential to the Higgs field. So this potential is still symmetric, so if you flip it, right, it still looks the same, but the minimum is non-trivial. So the field will not sit here on the maximum in the symmetric phase, but the field has to sit here, right? So the field has to decide where it's going to sit, but no matter where it's sitting, this will break the symmetry, right? And this symmetry breaking is then used in the standard model to give masses to the fermions and also to the gauge bosons. At the same time, you can also calculate this potential at large temperatures. By large, I mean temperatures which are larger than the electric scale, so the mass of the Higgs, okay? And you know that at really large temperatures, this potential will look trivial. So there's no non-trivial um, non minimum structure, and the field has to sit in the, in the symmetric phase. Right? So early in the universe, fermions were massless, gauge bosons were massless. Right? So this plasma was uh, much more trivial than it is today, where we have all these masses. And now there's a question how we get from this picture to this picture, and there are several possibilities. 
uh, this one or this one? What's the argument? Uh, that, the, uh, that the potential changes? Or well, how, how do you insert temperature into a field theory? Oh, <laughs> you should have come to the lecture on <laughs> Monday. <That's right. laughs> no, this is, um, okay, so th there is in principle a way to generalize uh, QFT to a system which has finite temperature, right? It's and put in a box with finite... Uh, well, in a certain sense, yeah. You okay. put it in a box, and then you just impose a certain temperature, and then you see what, what the system is doing. And then you can do all the usual stuff that you know from thermodynamics, like there's a partition sum, which in this case is a QFT partition sum. Okay. And you can calculate all the thermodynamic potentials, like the pressure or the free energy. And this is nothing else in principle than the free energy. So, yeah? for example, how do you compute H squared T squared? That's a computation, or...? Ah, this is a computation, yeah. And, and basically, Weinberg was the first uh, that calculated this coefficient. Okay. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's not as trivial as saying, okay, he calculated something and something came out. Of course, he was aware of the ramifications, right? So the paper was called uh, Symmetry Restoration in the Early Universe, right? So he calculated this and already knew that this was going to happen and something non trivial happens in the early universe. So, yeah. Um, where was I? Ah, yeah. So the, the question is now how you come from the top picture to the lower picture when you lower the temperature while you expand the universe, right? So one possibility is that this happens uh, everywhere at the same time. So you basically, you just, uh, the potential, this, this barrier is just, uh, yeah, produced really slowly during the expansion, and the field has basically enough time to just uh, track the minimum. So it, it will sit initially here, but then it will just slowly move to a new field value while the potential deforms, right? And in this case, you would uh, call this a second order phase transition or a crossover. But there's a little bit more exciting possibility, namely that there's a phase coexistence. You have a, the, the trivial minimum, but you also have the broken minima at the same time with the barrier in between. And in this case, the field cannot just uh, uh, roll to, the, to the, the global minimum of the potential. It has to overcome this barrier. And uh, this process is typically stochastic or statistic. So it's basically either thermal fluctuations or quantum fluctuations, which in certain regions of space push the field over the barrier uh, into the new minimum. Okay? So this process here will not happen homogeneously everywhere at the same time. Since coming from fluctuations, it will happen in certain locations first and then subsequently uh, all over the place. So in order to have gravitational waves, we have to be in the second picture. So what we would require is a first order phase transition where you have to overcome this barrier and have these bubbles that nucleate and then expand in, into the, the old phase. OK, so what's the status in the standard model? Well, um, the nature of the phase transition was studied a lot in the 90s. And in the 90s, the Higgs mass was, was not uh, known yet, right? But what people figured out is that, in principle, it can be first order, but only if the Higgs mass is really light, right? So to be specific, if the Higgs mass is lighter than roughly the W mass, then the uh, phase transition would be first order. But of course, now we know that the Higgs mass is too heavy. It's 125, right? So it's actually a crossover in the standard model. So this means, in the, in the standard model, there's no first order phase transition, no gravitational waves. Okay. But of course, we just started to probe the Higgs sector, right? We just found the Higgs. In principle, there could be a second Higgs. There could be more scalars in the sector, right? We don't know yet. I mean, uh, that's basically what the LHC tries to find out, right? And there are many possibilities to, to actually make the phase position stronger without much trouble. So one possibility is just to add one singlet, which I called S, to the standard model. Now you have two scalars. You have the Higgs scalar, and you have this new S scalar, right? And now you think, what is the most general potential I can write down? And you could, for example, write down something like this. And if you just choose certain parameters, so you don't have to do any tuning, just generic parameters, there are certain regions, parameter space, where you have two minima, which are separated by a barrier. So one minimum will have a VEF for the S field, and one minimum would be the minimum at late times, where the Higgs has a VEF, but the singlet doesn't have a VEF. Right? And in this kind of model, you would expect a really, really strong first-order phase transition and also a lot of gravitational waves. Okay? So I don't want to go into, de into the details of uh, this kind of model building, just to tell you, OK, in the standard model, there's no first-order phase transition. But this, of course, depends on the, on the scalar uh, sector. 
And this is kind of unexplored territory because we just started to, to uh, use the LHC to, to test this, uh, this model. Okay, so just to give you a little bit more hands-on uh, examples, the, the prime example for a first order phase transition is boiling water, right? So if you have a, a pot of water and you heat it up, then what you get is small bubbles of gas, and these gas bubbles will expand, and at some point all the water is gone and everything is gas, right? So here, now in the universe, in the early universe, when you have a, such a strong first order electric phase transition, for example, you also have these bubbles, and the bubbles are kind of a new state of matter, and these bubbles expand. But in this case, there's a lot of energy available, right? So these bubbles, they move with a speed, uh, almost of the speed of light, right? So it's a kind of a large fraction of the speed of light, and these bubbles carry a lot of energy, okay? And this is, of course, uh, interesting because it drives the plasma out of equilibrium, so it pushes the plasma around. And the moving plasma and also these violent bubbles will ultimately produce the gravitational waves. Okay, so the picture is that uh, initially the universe is kind of in the old state. Then at some point these bubbles uh, will pop up, they will expand, they push around the plasma, there's a lot of energy, in particular kinetic energy available, and once these bubbles start colliding, gravitational radiation is produced. And also subsequently, there's a lot of gravitational radiation produced by just the plasma wobbling around, and we will see this later, because I will also try to show <laughs> eventually a video of a simulation where you can, can see this more clearly. Okay, unfortunately, uh, the whole process is not so easy because there are many different kind of physics at play. So first of all, you have these bubbles, the bubbles collide, this produces gravitational waves, but also the plasma is pushed around, also these, this plasma motion will produce gravitational waves, eventually there's turbulence, or also the production of magnetic fields. So there's a lot of different uh, effects going on, and many of these effects are non-perturbative, right? So with standard perturbative methods, it's really, really hard to quantify this, yeah? Say it again? You have different bubbles, you have different values of H, right? They don't have to be all the same H. Yeah, in principle, yes, and that's what will ultimately produce the magnetic fields, right? So if you believe you have a, let's say, so let's say you have two bubbles, and every bubble chooses a different direction in SU2 space. Once these uh, bubbles collide, you can produce gauge fields, and these ultimately will lead to the magnetic fields. Okay, so that's additional evidence for these bubbles. This is additional, exactly, and that's also the problem. So there's not one source, there's all kind of stuff going on, and there are different sources, and, uh, but I must admit that turbulence and magnetic fields is really poorly quantified by now. So most of what simulations are doing is based on the first two points, the collisions and the sound waves. about scalar perturbations. I mean, besides gravitational wave, we should also produce density perturbations. Yeah, yeah, but these are, of course, let's say, uh, at the electric scale, the Hubble parameter was like two centimeters, right? So these are, even today, these are tiny. So, I mean, there, there might be fluctuations, but they are, of course, also damped. But even if they would survive, they would be tiny. You couldn't probe this today. That's the scale you're telling me, but the amplitude of this perturbation, can ah, you well, Yeah, but they, they would be typically suppressed by how much energy goes into the, these fluctuations compared to, but also fluctuations die out, right? So through the expansion, but also through decay into turbulence, for example. So fluctuations in the plasma will not survive forever, right? Yeah, but, but in principle, you're right, but, but it depends, of course, on the on the scale of the phase transition, right? I mean, what I consider mostly in the first part is electric, right? And at the time, the Hubble, uh, the Hubble uh, radius was, was tiny, and this, but today it would correspond to many, many, many patches, right? It's nothing you could, could observe because there are just too many patches from the universe in the, at electric scales, right? But if you go to lower temperatures, right, then uh, this basically universe then would correspond to less patches nowadays, and there could be an effect. But you have to go to, to quite low temperatures in order to see something. So it's, uh, it's not so plausible. But, but you, you got my argument with the scales. I mean, with the CMB, I mean, what you see in the CMB, um, basically the, the peak, if you remember the, the picture with the multipoles, right? This is a few, few degrees angle, right? And this was basically the horizon size at 
electrovolt scales, right? Now you go back another 11 orders, right? And uh, so the angles would be tiny. Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, just to, to give you, yeah, just to, to show this picture, this is one of the, the first simulations which was done in 2015. And here you can, this is kind of a slice of the simulation. And here you can see the kinetic energy. So there's, there are these bubbles that are nucleated in the plasma, and they, they expand, and at some point collide. And even after the phase transition is finished, there's a lot of kinetic energy in the fluid because the, the bubbles uh, push the, the fluid around and set it into motion. Okay, so um, just to be a little bit more quantitative, there are different parameters in the game. Just uh, if you see one of these uh, parameters on, in, in the later slides, that you roughly know what it means. So first of all, an important quantity is the temperature. Because the temperature, so the, the frequency of the gravitational waves which are produced relate to the horizon size of the, when they are produced by the phase transition, right? So this means if they are produced earlier, the horizon size was smaller, right? And even though there's redshift, this will lead to larger frequencies. Then there's another parameter which uh, comes from the nucleation probability, which is exponentially increasing in time. And this basically tells you how fast the phase transition is. And typically, the phase transition is somewhat faster than the expansion. So doing one e-fold when the, when the volume increases by e cubed, um, the, the basically, the phase transition would just be a snap. It would go really, really quick compared to the, the time it takes for the universe to expand. And then, of course, there's a one more parameter, which is the wall velocity, which will play a role because if the wall velocity is small, it will not push the, the, the plasma around so much. And then finally, there's a parameter which um, denotes the strength of the phase transition. And this is basically given by the latent heat. Right? So if the latent heat is small compared to the total energy of the system, then not much will happen because all the kinetic uh, fluctuations are small compared to the total energy. So this alpha parameter, which quantifies how strong the phase transition is and how large the latent heat is compared to the total energy, is really important. So this guy we would like to have ideally of order of 0.1 or something. Right? So this means the, the latent heat of the phase transition is a relatively large fraction of the total energy of the system. Okay, just to, to give you again this, this estimate, the, the peak when, when the gravitational wave is produced The peak is related to the radius of these bubbles, which relates to this better uh, parameter, which tells you how fast the phase transition is. And this is somehow numerically related to the Hubble parameter at the time. Right? So you can, in leading order, you can just think there are bubbles, which are roughly of the size of the um, uh, Hubble uh, horizon, and they collide and produce uh, these gravitational waves with the corresponding frequency. Then you also have redshift from production to now, and when you plug all the numbers together, what you find is that for typical numbers and for uh, temperature, which is electroweak, what you get is millihertz frequencies. Okay? So why is this important? Because ultimately, of course, we would like to observe these gravitational waves. Right? And this is basically one thing which uh, Christophe Grosjean and, and Gerardin uh, Savant figured out uh, in 2007. Uh, that we have uh, this relationship, and this is really, really important, because at the time there, there was a proposal for LISA, which is a space-based gravitational wave interferometer, right? And uh, millihertz are the typical frequencies that LISA can observe, right? So it's basically, there's just this uh, coincidence that the phase transition at electric scales would produce gravitational waves which are observable by LISA, right? So LISA is not, not uh, proposed to see this, right? LISA is proposed to see mergers of supermassive black holes and all kind of astrophysics. So it's kind of just an added benefit that if these gravitational waves are around from electric phase transition, these will, will eventually see them. So this is pure coincidence, and this is basically <laughs> what makes this field interesting. Okay, so now, of course, uh, there's not just LISA, there's also LIGO, and there are also these PTA experiments. So this is kind of a, a slice which uh, summarizes, on one hand side, the different observatories but also the different uh, possible cosmological sources. So what uh, these sensitivities, which come from the top, are the different experiments. So here, for example, you can see uh, LIGO, the different stages. And here is, for example, this LISA, the space-based gravitational wave observatory. And these are the pulsar timing arrays that I was talking about. 
And as I said, if the temperature is around 100 GeV, then the signal from a phase transition, which I draw here in, in red, would be exactly in the band that Lisa can be observed. However, of course, there might be different phase transitions, so if you just play around with the temperature, you might end up in different uh, experiments. Okay? So for example, if the temperature of the phase transition is in the MeV range, which is shortly before this Big Bang nucleosynthesis I was talking about, then you would have a signal in these uh, PTA experiments. On the other hand, if the phase transition happened at temperature which are tens of thousands of TeV, then there would be in the, in the LIGO band. And this is also interesting because, of course, this kind of temperature or energy you cannot test in a collider, right? It's completely illusionary that at some point you might build a collider which is big enough to test energies of tens of thousands of TeV, right? But at the same time, it's, of course, interesting that potentially you can test this kind of particle physics using gravitational waves as a prop. So there's a, something, yeah, an added, added benefit. Okay. What I also show here are other sources, like cosmic strings, which typically come with a rather flat spectrum, or also inflation, which also comes with a rather flat spectrum, but it's also already tightly constrained from CMB observations. Right? So typically, what you expect from inflation in most models would be too small to, to see with the LISA or PTA. All right, just so to summarize, we have all these parameters in the game. I just want to mention them uh, shortly again and, and give you a rough idea what, what happens. So there's this alpha parameter, which is the strength of the phase transition. And if you increase the strength, then of course your, your uh, gravitational wave power spectrum just moves up. So what I'm showing here is the uh, energy density in the gravitational waves as a function of frequency. This is the power spectrum. And if you increase alpha, the power spectrum moves up. If you increase the temperature, you just shift this plot to the right, right? So this is basically what we should already seen on the last slide. If you change the temperature, it basically just relates different frequencies uh, to the phase transition. And then there's uh, the speed of the phase transition, is parameter beta. And when you make the phase transition uh, quicker, then the signal becomes slightly smaller, and also the phase transition, uh, the, the frequency goes up because the bubbles are smaller, right? So basically the size of the bubbles is related to the speed of the phase transition. This slope seems to be exactly F square. Is there any <laughs> fundamental reason? Or F squared? Yeah, the, the well, in the OK, so F this, this one is F cubed. F cubed. F cubed. Okay. And there's but a phase space or? No, but there's an argument that if you have a, a source which is produced by a causal process, then at least it has to be F cubed. And that's exactly as so gravitational waves from a phase transition saturates this bond. So F cubed or, bl or bluer? Or. Uh, <laughs> No, or, uh, or yeah, plur, plur, or yeah, it, larger exponent, exactly, plur. Okay. So okay. That's F cubed? This should be F cubed, yeah. I hope so. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> let yes, me okay. check. It goes from yes, 10 yes. to the minus 11 to roughly 10 to the minus, uh, let's take one, one order, yes, 10 to the minus yes. 11, 10 to the minus 10, and yeah, this is two, no? So it's roughly three orders, yeah. This, part, this, this fits. Yeah, so this slope is a little bit more complicated and it also depends on the production mechanism. So this one is bubble wall collisions and this one would be um, kinetic energy in the, in the sound waves. But this is kind of schematic, right? So this is not a simulation result yet. This is just kind of a fit or no, schematic yeah, of it. But the, what I was interested in, you know, the F cube uh, rise is kind of universal or kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there are also other claims in the literature, but in, in most uh, simulations and also most semi-analytical approaches, you would recover this F cubed. And in, in some sense, uh, I'm not sure, you know the Weinberg formula, how do you calculate the gravitational waves? I mean, in principle, you just can relate the, the, um, um, the energy in the gravitational waves, right? The omega, this is somehow coming out of the out of this guy, right? Okay, and then there's a Planck squared, okay? So roughly speaking, this goes like omega squared. But what I'm showing here is uh, dg gravitation, so it's energy density, let's call it E. What I'm showing here is uh, the log plot, right? So it's log omega, so this would go by like omega cubed times some 
expectation value. And as long as this guy is, is just a number in the limit omega to zero, and that's what it turns out to be in a simulation, then it automatically goes like omega cubed. Yeah, but then there should be additional powers from phase space, no? Um, additional phase space? What do you mean? Yeah, because uh, increasing omega, you have more modes, so that should... Um, I think, no, 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 this is already captured here. Okay. Yeah. The only thing which will happen is the sky at some point goes down, right? So once you hit the, the, typical, the typical length scale, then, then everything will be suppressed, and that's basically producing the, the maximum in this plot. All right, so, uh, okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, simulations. So as I told you, there are all these different effects, and the plasma is pushed around, and this is a really nonlinear uh, effect, so you would like to keep these nonlinearities. And because of it, uh, typically people, what people do in order to get reliable spectra is to do large-scale simulations. Right? So this is one of the first simulations. So uh, there was a group from, oops, oh, what did I do? <laughs> There's a group from uh, Helsinki in Sussex that started doing these large-scale simulations. And this is a typical spectrum that, that they obtain in, in these large-scale uh, simulations. So these are really time-consuming and costly. So any of these simulations take like a month on a supercluster, so thousands of, of cores, right? So and because of it, I mean, this is also somehow bad for phenomenology, because I told you there are these four parameters, right? So if you want to do phenomenology at some point, of course, you would like to explore the parameter space and come up with uh, many, many different spectra and not just with one per, per month, right? <laughs> and uh, th this is basically why, why we wanted also to, to come up with a simulation, but we are not really numerics people, right? So <laughs> we don't want to run a 1,000 core cluster. So we wanted to do it uh, in a different way. And just to explain a little bit uh, what the motivation was and also how it works, a little bit at least, uh, I will go through a couple of slides and then uh, show the final results. Okay, so... so in order to understand what's going on, it's good to imagine just one bubble. Not many bubbles, just one bubble, right? So the system is completely spherically symmetric, and which means it becomes basically one-dimensional, right? And then you can look for solutions of the hydrodynamic equations, uh, depending on the wall velocity and all these other parameters. And this was basically done already by, by Landau and Lifshitz, right? And he found, uh, they found, uh, and also before, and people found different uh, kinds of solution, and one class of solutions, for example, are detonations. So these detonations occur when the wall velocity is larger than the speed of sound. So what, you show he what I show here is xi, so this parameter xi, sorry, I didn't show it on the slide, is basically the radial coordinate in units of time, and this is the time since nucleation, right? And it turns out, if you write everything in kind of this coordinate, then the solution is self-similar, right? So after a certain time, you have the solution, and after twice the time, the solution still looks the same, everything is just stretched by a factor two, okay? That's why there's no time dependence here. There's just a dependence on psi, okay? And what the plot is showing is the fluid velocity. So in front of the wall, nothing happens, but then behind the wall, um, the plasma is tracked by the Higgs field, right? So the, the, the Higgs field, rushes forby, so if you are just sitting in the plasma and the Higgs bubble is coming, all the particles couple to the Higgs, right, because they get a mass, and they, then they will just be tracked by the, by the Higgs bubble and follow, right? And that's exactly what you see here. At the same time, also the local temperature will change. What I'm showing here is, uh, for example, the, the enthalpy. Okay, but what, what this uh, picture shows you is that there are, in principle, different length scales at play. So the first one, is the size of the bubble, which is related to the frequency, but there's a second length scale, and that's the thickness of the shell. And parametrically, this is also related to the size of the bubble. But there's also a third scale, which you can't even see, and that's the scale on which the Higgs field changes, right? So remember, this is electric symmetry breaking. So outside, the Higgs is zero, and inside, the Higgs is finite. So the Higgs is changing, but there's a length scale associated with that, but it's tiny. It's like 20 orders smaller than the size of the bubble, right? And in principle, the problem of these simulations is that you have to resolve all these length scales. So you have to resolve the wall thickness 
course, you get the latent heat from the Higgs, right? But you also have to resolve the, the fluid shell thickness, the scale, and of course, the bubble size. So if you do a simulation, basically you have a, a grid spacing, which tells you how, how much you can resolve your fluid, and you have a box size, and somehow you have to squeeze these three physical scales into the box, right? And this is why you need a large box, and this is why it takes so much time and money. Okay? So our idea was now to get rid of one scale <laughs> in order to make the problem simpler, right? And uh, the scale we wanted to get rid of is this water scale, okay? So for us, the, the Higgs is not changing somehow smoothly. It's just really a theta function, right? But this, of course, comes with uh, other problems. So just to, to summarize this again, we wanted to work in an EFT, in an effective framework, where the Higgs field doesn't have any dynamics, right? But just are theta functions. But what we get uh, because of this uh, complication are shocks. So we basically have discontinuities in our hydrodynamic system. And typically, hydrodynamic systems with shocks are not so well behaved, right? So you have to be a little bit careful when you do numerics with them. OK, just to give you a rough idea why, I wrote down a really, really simple differential equation that you immediately can solve to show you the problem. So let's say this is your differential equation. So dt plus dx acting on f is equal to 0, right? So you know that the solution of this is just the right mover, OK? But now imagine that as an initial condition, I choose a step function. So now I have a step function, and I know that the, the complete solution is just a step function moving to the right, OK? But if you would feed this to a typical numerical code, there are two things happening. Either you have too much viscosity, which means the step function is washed out, or you have not enough viscosity. And then you get what's called uh, Gibbs oscillations. So this is a phenomenon that often happens in these uh, hydrodynamic simulations. And this is really bad because some physical quantities, like the energy density, can turn negative, right? And <laughs> once your energy density is negative, your code will for sure stop, right? So this is really, really bad problem. This is a problem you might live with, but which makes, of course, your, your result worse. OK. But uh, we are, of course, not the first one <laughs> that had this problem. And there's a huge literature uh, on, on this kind of problem. And uh, there's one scheme which was particularly well suited for the phase transitions. And that goes under the name uh, kogonov tetmore So it's a paper which has like 2,000 citations. It's 20 years old and describes one of these schemes, which exactly tries to, to avoid this conundrum, right? So it's even a little bit it's more complicated than and I told you because there are certain theorems telling you, okay, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. So what you can do is really limited, and the number of uh, algorithms that achieve it is also really limited. So it's relatively complicated. In any case, we just took this approach and implemented it, and then tested. And the first test is, of course, yeah. Uh, you, you you're doing simulations in in 3D, right? Yeah. And can can you uh, is it, does it make sense to do in 2D? Do you, can you get already some information ah. <laughs> about the spectrum and everything with um, 2D? Um, I guess certain things you could for sure study in 2D. I guess even turbulence you could to a certain extent study in 2D. Uh, Cavitational waves, I'm not sure. <laughs> I guess it doesn't make so much sense. Yeah. But I guess the dynamics of the fluid you could for sure study in in 2D. So you think about doing it in a more economic way and just yeah, it will save, uh, save uh, some yeah, yeah. computation time if you can yeah. do it. But what, what we want to do here is really get precise predictions for the power spectrum, and these will depend on the number of dimensions, right? So even so, I think you can can learn something by doing duty simulation. It's not what we are after here, right? Okay. So in, of course, in, in order to to benchmark uh, our approach, you go back to what you know, and this is a single spherical bubble, right? And what you see here is the simulation of a single spherical bubble. So we start with a really small bubble, which is just covered by like five grid points. This is a blue line. And then just let this bubble expand. And you see, as soon as the number of grid points is like 20, you exactly track the, the, the solution that is known from 1D hydrodynamics, right? So the, the yellow one, uh, sorry, the, the orange one is the self-similar profile that you know from hydrodynamics. And everything else are numerical results. And you see the violet one is already basically top-notch on, on what you expect. And henceforth, you can be sure that the gravitational wave spectrum will also be quite fitting. So what do we gain by that? Well, it's, it's a factor 2,000. 
So why it's a factor 2,000? Well, if you get rid of one scale, which means perhaps your, your grid size is not 4,000 points, but just 500 points, you gain a factor roughly 1,000, right? And that's exactly the factor we get. But the factor 2,000 means instead of running it on thousands of clusters for a couple of months, you basically do it on a desktop overnight, right? So this is, a, of course, a, from practicality point of view, this is a huge improvement. And it also means that now we can really explore the parameter space and produce many, many uh, different, different spectra. And when we looked at these spectra, we found, in, in general, uh, features which are shared by, by all our uh, power spectra. So the first one, as we discussed, is this k-cube, that really, really small k. Then, depending on the parameters, we might see a plateau, which goes like k to the 1. Then there's a branch which goes like k to the minus 3. And this is basically uh, noise from, from the lattice, right? So there are always these uh, features, these different parts of the power spectrum. And what's shown in, in color here is a fit to the data, and the data is the points, right? And you can do this many, many times and extract the, the parameters and then see if you learn something from the parameters, right? So I don't want to go into details, what, what we learn from the parameters, but one information I'm going to need in the last part of the talk is that there are these different branches of uh, the power spectrum. So k cubed, k to the 1, and then some fall off like k to the minus 3. All right. Uh, was there something I wanted to say? Well, this is just a summary. I, I think we are happy with our results. Uh, the, they are really accurate and reliable. Everything uh, works quite well, and it's fast enough to, to explore the parameter space, which is what we wanted to do uh, from the beginning. There are still a couple of loose ends and, and questions, like this deep infrared, for example, is, is a good question. Also, the role of turbulence, which we didn't study much yet, and a couple of other uh, points, which I didn't mention. All right, so, yeah. The, the, the takeaway is that, in principle, there is now this, this possibility to do simulations and get accurate uh, power spectra that you can compare with the phenomenology. So this brings me now to the, to the last part. So at least five to ten minutes, I wanted to talk about these uh, pulsar timing arrays. So I, I guess it's a pretty hot topic, and there are a lot of papers. So who heard what PTAs are and what they measured and all of this kind of, uh, yeah, so large fraction. That's really good. Okay, just to, to summarize for, for everybody else, so what you do is you, you have a pulsars, and pulsars are really, really good clocks. So they, they send a radio signal, which is typically in the, in the milliseconds, your way, and you can use these uh, pulses as really accurate clocks. So you don't have just one pulsar, you have many pulsars. So I think in, in, in the nanograph, at least, they have about 50. And then uh, you can check what happens to the pulses of all these pulsars. And the idea is now, if a gravitational wave is passing by, it will have an influence on the runtime of these pulses. So you will see kind of a modulation of these pulse signals coming from the pulsars. And that's exactly what they claim they've seen, right? So this is, on the, on the y-axis, is the excess timing delay in Fourier space, so as a function of frequency. And there are certain excesses that they see which seem to follow a power law, OK? So, uh, I mean, they had already an excess in the next to last release, but the excess became even more uh, stringent in, in, in the recent release, which was uh, this year. So, it, it's not just nanograph, there are also other uh, pulsar timing arrays, and by now all of them see an excess. So, it's, it cannot be, I mean, it could, of course, be something systematic, but it's not experimental in the sense that, uh, that it's because of nanograph, right? It's also, there are also, PPTA, which is in Australia, so they observe a different part of the sky, right? So it's definitely not the same pulsars they're observing. And also, they see an excess of, uh, of timing signals. So the first question you should ask at this point is, are these really gravitational waves, right? And there's one really thing, interesting thing in this game is that you can correlate the signal you see in different pulsars. And in case it is a stochastic gravitational wave source, you can calculate that actually the correlation only depends on the opening angle of the pulsars. So if you look at two pulsars, then the signals are correlated according to a certain function as a function of the opening angle, right? And that's this uh, Helling's down curve. So the x-axis of the Helling's down curve is the opening angle between the two pulsars that you're looking at. 
and uh, what you expect is a correlation function which behaves like this as a function of the angle, right? And what you see here, these violins, is basically the measurement from nanograph. So this looks really promising, I would say, right? So apparently the, the correlations they observe follow more or less the hitting stone curve. If you look really, really closely, you will see that actually the, the violins are systematically a little bit too high. So there seems to be a monopole component also, which is not understood. But uh, otherwise, uh, the data fits really, really well what you would expect from a stochastic gravitational wave background. Okay, so then the next question is, of course, what's producing these gravitational waves? And I would say the dominant interpretation, also in my mind, are uh, supermassive black hole mergers, right? So people know there are a lot of supermassive black mergers in the, in the center of galaxies. These will eventually merge and produce gravitational waves, and there are estimates how often this happens. So uh, the estimates, what is the amplitude that is expected, and what would be the, the shape of the spectrum. And what you see in red here are results from these uh, supermassive black hole simulations, right? And so perhaps I should explain what the axis are. So y-axis is the amplitude of the signal, and the x-axis is the power law slope that they do in the power law fit of this data, right? And the red curve are predictions from simulations of supermassive black holes, and the blue curves... That's the negative of the power slope or the power slope? Um, yeah, so gamma is... Okay, so let me think about it. So I think gamma is really in this figure, so it's really in the excess timing delay. And then you can convert it into a slope of uh, the energy density, of course, right? Ah, okay. And this I will at least do for two numbers <laughs> later on. So the, the amplitude spectrum is negative, but the energy spectrum is... Exactly, so it's, it's slightly blue. Uh, blue shifted, yeah, okay. blue tilted, yeah, exactly. I think it's uh, two-thirds, if I'm... So at least that's a prediction from the supermassive records. Actually, it's the prediction for n equal essence. Doesn't, doesn't yeah, yeah, but, but you see, this line here is a standard prediction from coalescence, right? But then in the simulations, there are additional effects, and this can modify the, what, you, what you expect from the, from the signal. Otherwise, I mean, you would conclude that basically supermassive black holes are ruled out, right? <laughs> so if you take it really at face value. Okay, but the next question is, of course, can you also fit uh, other signals, like my favorite uh, gravitational waves from uh, phase transitions? And people also did this, so the nanograph uh, collaboration did already the fit, basically using the, the results from our community. And what they found is that it can also explain the, the excess, as long as you choose the temperature and the strength and also the size of these bubbles in, in appropriate ways, right? And this is not, not too surprising. What is a little bit... Uh, perhaps not, not obvious, but encouraging, at least uh, for me, is the following. So I told you in the spectrum we see these two different parts, the one where, where you have k cubed and the one where you have k to the one. So if I, I uh, make the transition from, from the energy uh, density to, to this quantity, then I get these two numbers, right? So the deep infrared tail, k cubed, would, would sit at gamma equal to two, while the plateau, which was k to the one in our case, would sit at uh, gamma equal to four. So in some sense, it's sitting, the signal is sitting exactly between these two cases, so it's not too surprising that gravitational waves from phase transitions give an excellent fit <laughs> to the data. Actually, the fit is much better than for supermassive black holes, actually. Okay, but uh, this is, of course, not decisive. I, I mean, also in my case, if, uh, if you say, is this supermassive black holes? where we know these guys exist, or is it some beyond the standard model of physics which does a phase transition at the MEV, I would say, okay, the chances are like uh, 10 to 1 that it's uh, that the prediction of the supermassive black holes was just off and that it's not a phase transition, right? So the question is, how can we decisively tell in the near future if it really was a primordial source, so like strings or phase transitions, or an astrophysical source, like uh, supermassive black hole mergers? And... Uh, well, in principle, there are a couple of points that you can consider. So the first one, and I don't think this is the one that will lead to success, is just to, to measure the spectrum well enough that you can distinguish the two, right? But I think on both sides, there's enough freedom that no matter what you measure, there's always a claim that it fits, right? I don't think this will really work. Then, if it's really supermassive black holes, 
then one of these mergers will be closest to us. So it will not look isotropic, right? So there's kind of an isolated source which is stronger than everything else. And of course, they looked at these isolated sources, but they haven't found anything yet. But it's conceivable that in the next data release, they find one of these isolated sources, and that this would be, of course, a strong indication that it's rather supermassive click holes than, than something primordial. More generally, of course, you can now, like in the CMB, also just analyze, not just look for an isolated source, but look for anisotropies. Just look, is this isotropic? Because if it's really primordial, then it's to a really, really large degree, it would be isotropic. While if it's supermassive like holes, you would pick up some, some uh, anisotropies at some point. And the last point, which would be relevant, for example, for uh, cosmic strings, where you expect a really, really flat power spectrum is, if you see something in PTAs, for sure you would also see something in LISA, right? And just by not seeing something in LISA, for example, you can rule out cosmic strings. So this is, of course, another possibility. But to me, the most interesting, and I think this is probably uh, something that will be done pretty quickly, are uh, anisotropies. So already in the last data release, uh, Nanograph provided the following plot. So what they show is just an analysis, like they do in the CMB. So they have different uh, spherical harmonics, which come with uh, different Ls. These are just uh, the coefficients of the expansion in the spherical harmonics. Now there's these red, these uh, colored lines in this gray band, and these are predictions from the supermassive black holes. So, so the lines are an average prediction, and the band is kind of a, the variance in the prediction of the supermassive uh, black holes. So, but the prediction from supermassive black holes depends on the number of sources you put in. Uh, I mean, if you put one source, the anisotropy. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but uh, it's like this. So, so let's assume th these are extragalactic, right? So in leading order, they are homogeneous, right? And basically, you put everything in a box, and then you know the amplitude, and this tells you how many of them you have to put in a box. But in, ultimately, it doesn't matter so much. I mean, they did also an analysis where they varied all kind of stuff. And uh, of, you mean because of the closest isolated one? No, but I mean, the anisotropies depend. I mean, of course, if you have 10 loud signals, it's very... <laughs> if you have 10 loud signals, the anisotropy will be large. If yeah, you have yeah. uh, 1 million faint signal, it's very close to isotropic. Uh, to isotropic. <laughs> So, I mean, right, right. This, this, the, the, this bound depends on how much sources you are assuming. Mm, well, not quite, because, I mean, what they do in the simulation is they put, like, 3,000 sources, so many, many. It's not a small number, so uh, a large number. And then, of course, you have to reproduce the amplitude, right? So, in roughly, you know what the density is on, on these merger events, and this basically fixes all the numbers, no? With, with yeah, better but bands that span order of magnitude. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. But but uh, but but you're on the limit where you see many many thousand. Uh, so the accumulated signal from many many thousand uh, sources. It's not just isolated sources that you see, right? I would naively expect that these bounds on CS would scale as the square root of numbers of uh, sources. So you cannot you cannot have one bound for any number of sources. No, no, um, uh, how to explain this? It's okay, maybe I'm misinterpreting this plot. Uh, yeah, uh, perhaps we discuss a little bit in more detail how to interpret this plot offline. But in, in, in principle, um, um, if, you, if you think about shells, right, then also the outer shells will basically produce a lot because the volume of these outer shells are large, right? It's, it's not. Right, so it's always really uh, a superposition of many, many events that you see in any case. It's not that you just see the close ones. Because the, the far ones are just more abundant, right? Okay, so what I mean is that there must be a lot of assumption to make this Yeah, 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 I totally agree. And, uh, <laughs> and there are a couple of funny things going on in how they do this analysis and, uh, yeah. Okay, so the second information that you see in this plot are these dashed lines, and the dashed lines are upper limits from the measurement. Okay? And you can see that for L equal to 6, the upper limit already is at the lower bound of the, of this band, right? So it's conceivable that in the future, if this uh, upper bound goes down, at some point the data is in conflict with the hypothesis that these are supermassive black holes. Okay? So, and uh, I talked to certain people in Nanograph, 
and most of them think that this will basically be the, the analysis which ultimately tells you in the not too far future if it's really um, astrophysical or primordial. All right, so this brings me to the conclusion. So there is evidence for a stochastic gravitational wave background in building up in PTA, and this is, of course, really exciting. And there will be a combined result. So currently, it's not a detection yet, because it's like at three sigma or something. But there will be a combined result, and this will probably go beyond five sigma, and then they would claim a detection, right? So also, in my mind, the mergers of supermassive black holes are the most plausible interpretation. But there are also some indications that the origin might be uh, cosmological, like this, this anisotropy, or also that the, the slope doesn't fit so well with the supermassive black holes. Uh, yeah, there's one point I didn't talk about at all. There's also the question, how would you get a phase transition in the dark sector, for example, at the MAV scale? And there's, of course, uh, also correlation with particle physics, with beam up experiments, and, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, particle physics going on there as well. And with that, I conclude. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. So, questions, uh, Isabella, and then. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. I'm not sure I understood the last slide. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I understood the last slide. Yeah, I'm also not sure that I understood the last slide. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you detect uh, anisotropies in the background, you can say that they they come from supermassive black holes, most likely. Yeah. But can you cannot exclude that part of the background comes from. Uh, cosmological phase transitions. Yeah, yeah but um, I mean, it's, it goes back to the, the other argument. So let's say you have a phase transition at the MEV scale, right? Today, th the horizon at the MEV scale would be tiny. So there are a gazillion of patches which would give you necessarily a really isotropic result, right? In order to see something at, at L equal to 6, basically the patches would be almost as large as the sky, right? Which tells you that if it really was a phase transition, it would have happened in the really recent past, right? Okay, but can, can't you have a superposition of different backgrounds? The, the one from uh, phase transitions, the one from yeah, yeah. massive black holes, and so on? I mean, another explanation could be, for example, that something completely funny happens in inflation, right? And that these modes enter the horizon in the recent past. This is also, but this is also not so easy to, to construct. So I, I would say if you see an anisotropy, this is quite a tell that it must be astrophysical. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the nice talk. I have uh, one question that I really didn't understand, and then a question that I want uh, more information about. If you go back to the slide of the single bubble and the scales where one has to be much larger than the others, I think it's the wall and something else. Um, this one? Yeah, exactly. I don't understand the difference in between the wall thickness and the fluid shell thickness. Ah, okay. So, yeah, sorry about that. No, so what makes the, the phase transition is the Higgs field, right? And the Higgs field, so the, the wall is moving in this direction, and the Higgs field is basically zero outside mm -hmm. and uh, non-zero inside. So the scale on which the Higgs field changes is roughly given by one of the Higgs mass, right? which is basically 1 over metric scale, 1 over 100 GeV. So now, if you look at a single bubble, at the end, when these bubbles collide, the size of the bubble is roughly um, 1 over H, a fraction of, of uh, the Hubble parameter, right? So it's like, let's say, a hundredth of, of H is the size of the, of the bubble, right? And then if you look at a, at a self-similar solution, so let's say the, the bubble front is here, then this would be the thickness, right? And this is still, uh, let's say, 10% of this quantity. So this guy, which would be the shell thickness, is roughly 10% of R. Okay? So this is cosmological, this is cosmological, this is microphysics. And there are kind of 20 orders between this guy and, and these guys. Yeah. Okay, now I understand, thanks. And then the question that, uh, so you said that you had to do relativistic hydrodynamics to solve stuff and whatever. Why didn't you just borrow the whole code from the nuclear physics people? I mean, don't they do that kind of stuff? Uh, well, it's not, I mean, we are, we are having a plasma here which is purely relativistic, right? So nuclear physics is not really so relevant. I mean, we could have used something like, um, uh, Pencil, there's a pencil code, which is also doing relativistic hydrodynamics. But actually, the part we wanted to do yet 
uh, they didn't release the relativistic code yet. But we are actually in contact with them that they uh, implement what, what we are doing here. Also, a tricky point here for us, the Higgs field is the background, right? So basically, the, the, the way that the simulation works is that we have these bubbles. The bubbles we put by hand, and then we tell the system that the equation of state inside is different than the equation of state outside, right? And for that to implement this, you would, would have to, to modify all these codes quite severely. So for us, it was easier to implement it ourselves than to, to try to learn this, uh, how, how a pencil works, for example. Perfect, thanks. And then besides, it's of course, also fun sometimes to do something you never did before. No? <laughs> um, I have a, maybe a stupid question. Is, uh, so if, if the electroweak phase transition happens at the MEV scale, this, this uh, yeah, yeah, I should say it's not the electric phase transition anymore, right? In this case, I, I tried to, to mention this in the last point. You would consider a phase transition for, let's say, in a dark sector, right? I mean, it cannot be any standard model physics. This would be would screw up BBN because really this, badly. Because these energy scales, we observe them in the, particle, in the colliders, right? So right, we, right. We of, of course, in this case, it would be uh, much harder to, to make the connection to colliders, right? Because it's at so low scales, and we think we understood how physics works at the MEV. And this is, of course, also one of the reasons why I personally believe it's rather <laughs> supermassive big holes in a phase transition. But uh, you're perfectly right. But uh, you can conceive a model where you just have a dark sector, in the dark sector, you have a phase transition. It produces gravitational waves. And in principle, uh, there's not much interaction between the sector and the standard model. And there are no bounds. The only thing you have to be a little bit careful with is uh, N effective, right? So there cannot be too much energy in the sector, because otherwise you yeah, are not consistent with the BBN or C CMB bounds. OK, thanks. You don't modify the Hubble constant uh, in time uh, when you do these kind of things. I mean, BBN is sensitive to that. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. This, this would be the N effective mm. bound. No, if you have additional radiation, for example, you yeah. would see this in... And uh, you, you know we also <laughs> work with <laughs> Kai Schmidt-Hobeck on that, who yeah. did exactly that, no? Okay, yeah. It's not always the same thing, but in this case, probably, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, I don't. S ah, yes. Good. Uh, what would uh, cause this monopole signal in the, um, uh, in ah, the yeah. nanogram? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's not a it's, it's not a signal, but I mean, what, what they did, of course, is to to look at uh, the um, multiple expansion of this uh, curve, right? And then you see that basically the Helling's down s starts with a quadrupole, right? and has some higher monopoles, and all these are consistent, right? But there's a, a certain monopole sitting there, which is not part of Hellings Downs, and it's unexplained. I, I don't know if we, I asked several people and asked this might be this might be instrumental or something, right? Monopole, you might think, OK, there's just an overall effect or some, <laughs> somehow happening. But they said, uh, well, they, they would exclude this, and they don't know. Yeah? But I mean, the good thing is that the nanograph is the most sensitive right now. They have the most data. But there, there are a couple of experiments. In particular, there's a Chinese PTA experiment. And this has really a great sensitivity. So they are not running uh, since such a long time. So uh, nanograph is running since 15 years or something, right? So just need a lot of time to see a gravitational wave in the nanohertz, because nanohertz are years, right? Uh, so, so the Chinese experiment doesn't have much data yet. But they are super sensitive, so I think at some point they will just overtake and become uh, better than nanograph, and hopefully this gives an independent check on that, yeah. Okay, so I don't see any... You have another question? No. <laughs> okay, so let's... Uh, yes, uh, Thomas. Well, uh, you mentioned this uh, scalar singlet extension of the standard model, which was always used as the vanilla example for first order space transition. But if you make it dark matter, as you were mentioning, I think what, it's not so what, easy. Yeah. What, what, it's not so easy anymore, no? Because you yeah, need yeah. to be at the TV scale, and then you don't modify so much the, the electrolytic yeah, yeah. transition, no? isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. you need to take other examples, maybe, you know, like... Uh, yeah, yeah, this uh, dark matter, I, mean, yeah. I, I yeah. agree. I think if you take all the recent bonds into account, probably it doesn't 
doesn't work so. But on, on the other side, uh, I mean, it's, this model is also called as a nightmare model because uh, basically it's really hard to exclude that LHC, right? So if you make the singlet uh, heavier than half a hex, there's basically nix, nothing you can go for, right? And then you would need a linear collider to, to see it. Well, if it's dark matter, I think CTA... Yeah, if it's dark matter, of course, uh, this would change CTA will uh, exclude it from yeah, yeah. Uh, up yeah, to yeah. 10 TV or so. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah I think uh, the dark matter hypothesis, so S cannot be the dominant dark matter. I, I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah, if, it, if the singlet driving the electroweak phase transition right. is the dark matter, then you need a large coupling, mm -hmm. and then... It right. gives you also direct detection constraints. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to mention it because it's, this is a two symmetry, so you have a stable particle. So, but if you, I'm, I'm, I, I completely <laughs> agree that if you would take it at face value and just crunch the numbers, probably it's ruled out as a, as a dark matter by now. Okay, so let's thank uh, Tom Thomas again for this very nice follow-up. <laughs>